In Galatians chapter 1 is where we are. We need to back up. We're, at, we're really at verse 7, but we need to back up at verse 6 for at least just a couple of minutes. And uh, by way of reminding you what's going on or some of the things that we talked about last week, book of Galatians is uh, one of the, the first books that was written by, by Paul. It could be, and depending upon when you date uh, 1 Thessalonians from a critical standpoint, it could be the first, if not right at the first written to the churches of Galatia, written, if you will, to South Galatia, to those churches that Paul went to, or a lot of those Paul went to on his first missionary journey. And when you, you, you get there, you find out this book is a book that talks about freedom. It's called the Magna Carta, if you will, of Christianity, Christian liberty, being set free. That is a theme that really runs through this book, but we will hit it more at the third and fourth and fifth chapters of this book. Paul spends the first two chapters, really, defining, defending his ministry. And that's important because of several reasons. First of all, when you, you get to, into to, to this chapter, and you, you see that that one thing that or one thing you got to remember is is that if it's written around 48 AD that Paul admittedly has been teaching and preaching but he was only converted to Christianity it's believed at 33 AD so he hasn't been a Christian that long 13 years and word as it travels travels still that probably the bad, right? He's a fellow that brutalized Christians and not that he was preaching the gospel. And we'll, we'll spend a little time, maybe we'll get through this chapter and talk about his, his trip to Arabia and, and a few other things along the way. But we get to, to the, the sixth and seventh verse of the first chapter and as Paul is defending really the gospel, and his ministry, Paul is trying to explain to these people that what he is going to tell them in the rest of this epistle is a revelation from God and that they need to listen, that it is not from him, that he is not the individual that they think he is or that some have heard, that he is trying to help them with the truth. And so in verse 6 and 7, he says, I marvel that you are so that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. And we talked a little bit about that last week. We talked about how that the word different here in verse six has the idea of different from the standpoint of like we would think of maybe dog and cat. We talked about the difference between a watch. You know, they're very similar, but they're all watches. And at the same time, too, there's differences like from the standpoint of dog and cat, very much different. And that's what Paul uses. The word Paul uses here is the word heteroi, which is the idea of completely opposite, different. But then he goes on to say, and that's where we're going to pick up, verse 7, he says, which is not another. In other words, it's different, but it's not different. Now, I want to, I want to stop there because I want to, to backtrack a little bit into verse 6, and I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that they have moved, Paul says. That they have, as Paul says, they have turned or moved away. The word turn there is in the, the present active indicative. It just simply means they are in a process of deserting or turning away from. It's continuous action. Now, He'll use that again later to talk about his ministry. But here he says, he says, the, you all are moving away. You're continuing to move away, deserting the truth. Those that say you can't fall from the grace of God. Difficult time with this verse. Because this verse teaches, yeah, you can. They, those in Galatia, they were deserting truth. 
But Paul says while it is different, it is not different. What they were trying to do is pretty much what we found out when we studied the book of Hebrews. They were trying to take the New Testament and put the Old Testament with it. And to say that there were things in the New Testament that they liked and that they were willing to go along with, but they were not willing to give up certain of the laws, namely circumcision, but that was not the only thing. They were not willing to give up the old law, so they wanted to combine the two. And Paul has tried to tell them, the Hebrew writer, of course, this was years later, but we've studied it not long ago. The Hebrew writer was trying to tell those folks to whom he wrote that there's a difference. And not only is there a difference between the laws, between the covenants, but the old law, the old covenant, is done away with. It is no more. And Paul is trying to show them, the in this book of Galatians, Paul is going to try to show them or not try to, he does. Paul is going to show them that the old law was binding. The old law didn't allow for much. The new law does. The new law, there's freedom. Now, when we get to that point in the third and fourth chapters especially, we're going to look at that idea of freedom and freedom of it within religion, and we're going to look at it from the standpoint of what Paul is teaching, but we need to understand and we need to kind of get this in our thinking as we move forward. Freedom in religion does not free does not mean freedom from religion. It does not mean freedom of religion. It does not mean freedom from the standpoint of you can do any and everything. But Paul is going to try to show a great distinction as we move forward between the old and the new law. And the new law being, as like I say, when we studied the book of Hebrews, we found out that it's much better. Much better. And so Paul says, I, I just marvel at this idea that you've moved to another gospel, which is not another. But you notice what he says. But there are some who trouble you. There are some opponents there are some folks that create confusion. And notice that he says, and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. They want to pervert. The word pervert has the idea of they want to, to reverse or they want to change. Now see, we thought, unfortunately, we thought that that was something new in our era. People changing the truth. But it's always been true. People have always wanted to change the truth. Go back when we studied Genesis on Sunday mornings to, to in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, Satan, changed the truth. Added one word, but changed the truth. Now, folks change the truth in a lot of different ways today. There's, there's uh, the idea of modernism, which simply says that Truth is relative, that it is not absolute, that it really doesn't matter, that one is as good as another. The denominational or denominationalism has changed the truth to fit what it wants to so that it can attract more people. Not necessarily concerned about the truth, but concerned about numbers and concerned about the finances instead of the truth. But Paul says, while there are those that would trouble those folks, they're creating confusion, and we don't know whether this is physical or mental confusion, or maybe both. But he says, they, they have changed or reversed the gospel of Christ the gospel pertaining to, the gospel that belongs to Christ. I want us to, to stop for just a second, and I want us to, to think about what is the gospel. And that's going to be important here in the next couple of verses. When we think of gospel, what do we think of? Good news. The truth. 
we think of the gospel, we think of the good news, because really and truly, that's what the word means. It's euangelion, you meaning good, and angelos, it comes, really, you get the idea of message, good message, remember, angelos, angels. Well, it's kind of the same idea, messenger. We talked about angels being messengers. So it's the good message, the good news. The gospel, we often say, well, the gospel, really, when you break it down, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, breaks it down pretty much you know, for us, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I like pretty much what a, a preacher I heard Monday in a workshop I was in said with regards to the gospel. He said, while all of that is true, he said, let's be honest, the gospel is Jesus. It is Jesus Christ, which encompasses all of that. And that, that's true. That's really what Paul is saying here. There are some that are trying to change the gospel of Christ, the teachings of Christ. But even we, or an angel from heaven, or excuse me, but even if we, I didn't read that right, but even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any of the gospel to you, then what you, we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Now, we often use verses out of context. We quote verses and we use them for what's called proof text. Proof text. When we don't get everything around them. Verse 8 is used a lot of times, and I think correctly so. Don't get me wrong. I think you can use this verse. But those that are Mormons. Now, Mormonism is not in my family directly, but indirectly it is in my family. From the standpoint, it's my brother-in-law's had some folks uh, that he was very, very close to that were Mormons. And so I'm not saying this lightly. But their belief is based upon the idea of Joseph Smith and receiving some tablets from an angel. And an angel then speaking to them. An angel is very heavily incorporated in their teaching. A lot of the old time preachers, if you will, come to this verse and say, see, you got to be careful. Well, I think that that's a, a good use of this verse. But within the context, Paul says, even if we, somebody, us, part of us, or an angel or a messenger that proclaims he has come from heaven. In other words, anybody that preaches any other gospel to you than that which we preach, any other, hetero, other, different, perverted, changed gospel from that which we've preached to you, let him be accursed, anathema, God's judgment upon an individual. One of the things that I think we have gone in the other direction, I mean, you, you've heard of the pendulum, you know what a pendulum is. Pendulum, of course, swings one way, and then it swings the other. And in, in church circles, religious circles, you, if you trace history within religious circles, one of the things you find out is that religion is a constant pendulum. It goes from one way, and then to counteract it, it goes the other way. And it, unfortunately, you cannot stop in the middle. Wished it could and wished it would. But it can and won't, seemingly. You go throughout history and you find folks that, you know, taught this and it was error. And so folks wanted to counteract that error. And so they began to, to teach the truth, but then they carried it way too far and it goes way out in the other direction. And so when you, you look at this and you think, well, there are some that are changing the truth. And Paul says... They don't need to change the truth. They're preaching things that are not right. They're preaching error. One of the things in that pendulum is in modern day. We have not done, in my opinion, a good job explaining to folks that while there is grace 
And oh, how thankful I am for it. And there is mercy and how thankful I am for it. That there is a difference. Now, let me explain. One of the things that has been troubling to me for the last 20 years has been the fact that the millennials, especially, have come to this idea that there's really no difference. Suzanne and I, Suzanne saw last night on Facebook, uh, would be actually a grandchild of, of some folks that in years past attended where I preached when I was at the time. The grandfather, last I heard, was an elder in the church, but evidently their children are going to a community church. And the terms that were used for the salvation of this young child were not what I would want to hear. And so I got on the internet and did a little research and found out that where they're going to church is close. But it's not there. Somewhere along the line, and maybe these children were taught well. They were when I when I was there. Not that I was teaching them. Their parents were doing a tre tremendous job. But we didn't. Te they didn't teach them completely the idea of there's a difference. Now, we don't need to be ugly. We don't need to be. Uh, Dogmatic as we've been through the years, and I'm not condemning. Let me say this: when I say this, I'm not pointing a finger at those that preached 50 years ago and condemning them for for the efforts and what they did. They did different than what we do today, and part of that is because of the time frame in which they were in. They could be more straightforward. You can't be that straightforward today. You run people off. Uh, folks were folks were a little more straightforward in that day and age. But having said that, we, we need to understand that there is a difference. That the truth, while God's grace allows for things, the truth is still the truth. Absolutely. And it must be followed. We cannot tinker with the truth. Now, we can tinker with the periphery, if you will. We've talked about this before, but we'll just bring it up again. We we understand, and correctly so, that we're the Lord's Supper upon the first day of the week. The Bible tells us that. Gives us command, gives us an example. Take the Lord's Supper upon the first day of every week. We do that. The Bible doesn't tell us how to pass it out, right? It tells us to do it, but it doesn't tell us how. The Bible tells us to take care of folks. James 1, verse 27 doesn't tell us how. And so you get an idea there that there's a truth there to be followed, but then there's a grace that allows flexibility in areas. But the truth itself teaches that there is a difference. There's the truth, and then there are things that are not true when they begin to teach things that aren't true. I think I've shared with you this. When Ethan, our son, was <clears throat> about to go off to Free Hardman, uh, he and I had a lot of conversations. Uh, we, we played golf every Saturday and sometimes through the week, if we could. And one of the conversations that we had was, is I said, son, I said, when you began to get out on your own, and you begin to find church to go to, and you get away from Fried Hardman, <clears throat> and you find the love of your life, and you begin to find church that uh, you're going to worship with. If they teach something other than what you've heard your mom and daddy teach you, you need to ask a lot of questions. Because we believe that we have taught you the truth, and you have heard countless sermons from your daddy that's when he rolled his eyes. You heard countless sermons from your daddy that 
believe that this is what is true and right. And when you hear something to the contrary, you can come talk to me about it, but you need to question them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I think he's made some good choices uh, for the most part. I know when he went down into Jackson, Mississippi for the year that they lived down there, he had trouble finding the church that he fit in with. And I went, Suzanne and I went two or three different times because we went on vacation and all down there. And I can see why he had trouble finding the church that he really needed to find. But he found a good one. Uh, Brother Gary Hampton, wonderful gospel preacher. He found the church where Gary preached and he ended up going there. But it meant he had to go all the way across town, Jackson, Mississippi. He lived on one side and the church was well outside on the other. And so we need to be sure that we understand there's a difference. And Paul is trying to teach that here to these brethren in Galatia. There's a difference. And so let me finish verse 9 and then I'll open it up. He says, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. He says, he says, you be sure that they preach the truth. That was important to Paul, and it should have been, and it should be important to us as well. Anything anybody like to say or add? You know, there's a guess there uh, from the standpoint, was it Paul and Barnabas? Was Barnabas with him yet? There, That could be a possibility. Um, other than that, we don't know for sure. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. It, but it, it could be. Um, it could be another possible. I mean, there's not a, a definitive answer that I can give to that. And so uh, it's. Most people just go, we don't know exactly who the we was. Well, good question, though. Any Anything else? Or anybody want to take a stab at that one? Okay. Well, Paul says in verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul gets philosophical at times, doesn't he? And, and he, it's almost like a dog chasing his tail. You don't, you don't, he seems like he goes in a circle here. But does he really? Let's look at it. He says, for do I now persuade men or God? Well, yeah, you're, you're, you're working on persuading men. You're trying to show men and trying to help men. He says, do I seek to please men. Now, Paul did seek to please men, didn't he? There was a question with regards to who being circumcised. Titus wasn't, right? Timothy was. The reason being because of what men thought. It wasn't a matter, and Timothy's circumcision wasn't a matter of what the law said. In other words, let's do, let's be circumcised because of the old law. It was because he felt like he could get in with the Jewish background people easier. So when Paul says and implies here, do I seek to please men? He seems to be implying, no, you know, I, I, I don't seek to please men. I seek to please God. But, Paul, you've acted in such a way as to please me. But understand, when we put the two together, there's a difference. And I'm going to kind of leave it at this and tell you just to trust me till we get to the third chapter. And the difference is this. The difference is Paul in pleasing men 
and doing certain things at certain times did it because, first of all, it was not a violation of the will of God, but did it because it made it easier with men. He never violated the will of God to please men. Okay? So, we'll give you, uh, I, I'll give you something, throw it out, and like I said, I'm just going to throw it out and leave it and let you kind of think about it till we get on into this book. But there are things done in religious circles today that are done to please men and not God. And, and when you think of that, think of some examples because we're going to talk about that when we get to the third chapter. But there are things that in religious circles that are done plainly just to please men. Some of them are a violation of doctrine and some of them are not. So like I say, I'm just going to leave that there if you don't mind. And we'll move forward. Anything else? Because Paul begins a new thought. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you got it. It, you, it. it has, but but here's the difference. You know, used to when you watch TV, you had three channels, right? ABC, NBC, and CBS. And then you know what? In the 70s, all of a sudden you had TBS, and you could watch Atlanta Braves baseball, right? So you had you had four channels. And you had PBS, excuse me, you had five channels you could watch. That's pretty much it. Now how many can you watch? Oh, one at a time, right. When you stuck a finger up, I knew what you were thinking, Darcy. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> but uh, you, can, you, you can watch, you know, a multitude, really. There's no telling how many you can get. And so, uh, you know, used to... There was a, my father, you know, I've told you was a manager of a department store. And there was uh, just down the, at the end of the block and turn and make a right. Different people at different times uh, had a uh, ice cream parlor in there, in this little shop. And every once in a while, dad would send me down there to get some ice cream. And I really only remember chocolate, vanilla and strawberry. But now you go anywhere and, you know, there's 11 million choices. Not that many, but there's a lot. And so that's kind of where we are even in religion today. It's a lot of choices. We have to find what's right. And that's, yes, you know. But it's, it is interesting to think about Paul did not change his message for men, but he changed other things for men. And while Paul, as he said in 1 Corinthians, he says, I became all things for all men that I might by all means gain some, said earlier in that same book in 1 Corinthians, in the fourth chapter, he makes this statement. He says, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of other men's judgments. In other words, he says, it really doesn't matter what you think of me. <laughs> but then he, he did dabble in that idea of, you know, well, let's let's... Make sure we make folks happy. All right. Enough about that. Paul begins, he says, but I make known to you, brethren. This is That's an interesting phrase. Because when he says, I make known to you, he, he says, I, I, I'm revealing this. I'm certifying this. I'm making it clear to you. Notice that he uses the word brethren. He's showing a close relationship here. He says, I want, to, I want you to know that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. In other words, it's not a tradition. It's not a tradition. In the church, we do things that, and they become 
repetition, right? Of X number of songs before the, before the Lord's Supper. One song after the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper contribution right after it. How many folks really know the Lord's Supper is just the bread and fruit and the, through the vine and not the bread through the vine contribution, right? How many young people really through the years have thought that? Uh, we do things that are of tradition, and there's nothing wrong with tradition. Sometimes in our traditions we get bored, and sometimes in our traditions we begin to do things without thinking, and that's when a tradition becomes bad. I had a preacher friend of mine a few years ago, and he said, you know, he said, our congregation is just steeped in tradition. He said, I'm trying to do something a little different, and by a little different, he meant maybe uh, <clears throat> having two songs and, and a prayer and then him, and then, you know, maybe uh, maybe him lead a song in the worship service. In other words, nothing what we would say unscriptural, just just breaking the tradition. And he said, I'm going to do that every Sunday. And I said, I don't think that's a good idea. And he said, well, why? I said, well, first of all, you have those that love their tradition are very steeped in their tradition, and you're creating confusion. I said, now to break it, break it up every once in a while is not a bad idea. But to break it up every Sunday, I said, guess what that becomes? He said, I don't know. I said, it becomes tradition. And I said, plus you're going to find that there's not that many variations <laughs> that you can do something new every Sunday. Well, several months passed and we were riding down the road together. And he said, I'm having a hard time finding something new to do. I said, yeah, I told you. <laughs> I said, just do it every once in a while. Just do it, you know, every once in a while, lead a prayer before you start your sermon or in the middle of your sermon or, or a song. He was very, he's a very talented song leader. Song in, in the middle of it. I said, that's fine. As long as your elders say it's fine. I said, that's fine. It's not nothing wrong with it. But there were those that evidently with regards to Paul, get back now to the church Galatia, that we're possibly going to say, well, what you're preaching is just something that people have practiced through the years, which is interesting because the church is not that old at this time. But there would be those that would say that. And he says in verse 12, he says, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. The word that's used for taught here is interesting. It really goes back to the old Jewish idea of being uh, of learning by rote over and over. Uh, the old Jewish oral law. You remember the the Jews had an oral law, and it was simply that which was passed down from generation to generation, and it was passed down by word of mouth. Mo you know, mamas mamas taught their babies. Grandmamas taught their taught mamas, and mamas taught babies. And of course it kept being handed down. Paul says, I didn't receive it from the standpoint of being something that was handed down, the old law. Nor was I taught it. In other words, it didn't come by somebody else teaching me. Now, Paul, remember, had a teacher, Gamaliel. He said, I wasn't taught it. But he said, it came, and, and notice the word but. When you're, you know, I try to teach you various things to watch for. This is when you when you see the word but, but's a contrast. Here's the first thing. Here's how he laid it out. He says he says it's not the man. He said I didn't receive it from uh, traditions or from the old old way of handing things down from man. He says I wasn't even taught it. But then he says but here's the contrast. Okay, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Through the unveiling, the word revelation there means the unveiling. It came through the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Now, you have to ask the question, is Paul saying that his revelation came from Jesus, or is he saying that his revelation came concerning Jesus, Jesus thus being the one that's revealed? 
I, I tend to lean more, especially when you get down to verse 15 and 16, we kind of see the answer to that, that he's basically saying that what he had received was the revelation of Jesus, not from Jesus, but of Jesus. And like I say, when you get down to verse 15 and 16, uh, notice verse 16, he says, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And so Paul says, what I'm teaching you is Jesus Christ. I'm teaching you the gospel. I'm teaching you the good news. I'm teaching you the message. And so he he looks at himself and he says, look here for you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. He says, you heard, you heard. My former conduct, the word conduct there means way of life. In other words, this was not something I just went out and did occasionally. He said, this was my way of life. This was what I did. And this is how I acted. This was my way of life. Well, what was your way of life, Paul? To, to, to persecute the church, to do whatever I could to destroy the church. Steeped in Judaism. Remember Paul's background? He was a Jew. Paul said in the book of Philippians that, that he was circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of Pharisees. And so Paul's able to say here, he says, he says, now, they heard that. You've heard that. You've heard the folks talk about that, how that I conducted my life. And then he says in verse 14, and I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries. I moved forward. I moved forward. I advanced. I moved forward. I, I was... I was beyond many of my contemporaries. Notice what he says. Being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. I was advanced over some of my other folks, my other friends, my other kin folks, my other folks that were around me, my neighbors. I was more advanced. That's a compelling thought, isn't it? Paul was advanced. Do you get a sense that Paul had a zeal for God? I do. And he wanted folks to follow God's will. So when he was a Jew, Persecuted church. He, pardon the expression, light. He said, okay, this is what needs to be taught. And so he was extremely zealous there. This reminds us of a passage in Romans, the 10th chapter. Paul says, moreover, I bear them record that they have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. Paul was talking there about certain ones, and he says, there are folks that have a zeal for God, but they're not walking in the way that they should walk. They're not, they're not letting God direct them. I like the way Dan Winkler in a conversation um, several, some of us were having when we were coming to graduate school, but Dan made the statement, he said, he said, do you remember the governors and, and trucks? You know, they only they let you go up to a point speed-wise. You can't go past it. Yeah. He said, that's the way I view an idea of, of, of having a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They, they weren't limited. They were just bouncing off the walls, and they needed to be contained by the Word of God. Now, Paul says here, with regards to himself, he says, I was zealous. But that zeal did not conform to the truth that he was teaching now. And so Paul is simply setting himself up as, he says, I was a persecutor. Now he's going to turn himself, and we're, going to, we're just going to stop right here unless somebody has wants to just go on. But verse 15 
he's going to say, you know, but I'm a believer in the truth. And then in verse, last part of verse 16 and verse 17, he says, and I'm preaching the truth. So he went from a persecutor to a believer to a preacher. And we'll talk about that next week. Is there anything else Well, okay. Uh, Galatians say it was written AD 48. Believe it's believed that Paul was converted to the cause of Christ around AD 33. Now, if you want to use a different calendar, AD 30, and then thus it would be 48 minus 3, 45. So, but we'll just use the common thought. See, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 15, 19 or 20, Paul said that he saw Jesus, resurrect, the resurrected Jesus, he saw him. It's believed that he was his conversion was not long after that. And so A.D. 33, so you're talking about, you know, just a few years subsequent, 14, 15 years later, he's already preaching, teaching, Already been on the first missionary journey, because he went on first missionary journey in '46. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. Evidently, right after he was converted, he went down to Arabia. Uh, he'll talk about that here, and we will we will definitely get to it next week. I thought we'd get to it this week. We'll get to it next week. Um, and made a little trip there, and so he it has been a while because it seems as if. When you begin to put, and there's some discrepancies in the chronology of Paul, but when you, you put it all together, uh, he's converted, he goes down to Arabia, which is, just just to catch you up, that's it's really north of the Red Sea, but south of, of Jerusalem, south of the Dead Sea, but it actually comes up then on the east side, Arabia then, or, or where he went, was considered then on the east side of the Dead Sea and the Jordan River and came up into Damascus. That was considered Arabia at that time and considered where all he went. And he went there for a while. The exact time we don't know because he just makes a reference to it. And so we have to kind of establish that. So there are dis some discrepancies, but it's a little while. And like I say, he's already been on his first missionary journey. The first missionary journey didn't last but a few months, a couple of months. And so, as in contrast to the third, which lasted for years. But so he he wants to get away from the the preconceived idea of who he is. And it's fascinating to me the when you put a time schedule on it, there's still a few years and it evidently is still lingering which reminds us to, to be careful how we act because it still lingers among people. Anything else? Good point. Good question. George says, I got to shut up. Well, all right. Well, we thank you all. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, for the many blessings. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word. Thank you for this wonderful book, for what it teaches us and what it shows us and how that we learn that you have revealed your will to us, and how that we are to, to follow it, that we are to, to be not only learners of it, but we are to, to live it out in our everyday walks of life. We ask that you be with those that Jay mentioned in our announcements, that those that are hurting, those that are going through difficult times, be with Diana and her family as they go through this, this time. 
in their life, and we ask that you give them the strength that they need. We ask that you watch over us, that you bless us and keep us. Watch over us and hold us as we hold to you. For this is our prayer in Christ's name, amen. Y'all have a fantastic rest of the week, and we'll see you Sunday, if not before.